Um, in this paper, I take material from four floods. Um, we had uh, hundreds of floods since the time that we had documents since the year 30. And um, there is no way you can count them. You can, some floods are very big and others are very small. So just remember it. there are numerous floods, and I just took a couple of floods that are well documented from the year 1675, 1825, 1916, and 1953. And 1953 is the flood you might know because it also flooded parts of England, and it was one of the largest disasters of the 20th century, at least in the Netherlands, for it cost 200 people to die. Sorry, 2,000 people. 2,000 casualties. Um, two uh, remarks about the physical aspects of flood disasters in this part of the world. The typical storm pattern for these floods that is that it starts with some days of strong southwesterly or westerly winds, pushing water in from the ocean into the North Sea Basin. And that uh, weather often includes a lot of rain, so the dikes, which are basically earthen walls, they become soaked. And then the winds develop into a strong northwesterly storm that pushes the water from the North Sea into the sea arms as the Zuiderzee, which is this sea arm, and into this, uh, this delta of the River Rhine, which is the River Rhine we really used. What happens is that in those cases the water spills over the dikes and then attacks the dikes from behind, and that's the weak part of the dikes. So the dikes break from back to front, and not the other way around. Often people think that the sea sort of comes and pushes the dikes away, but that's not how it works. Um, and the second remark <coughs> I'd like to introduce this is the, the sort of landscape. On average, before 1800, the difference between sea and land was about two to three meters. Uh, the soils, soils are low in the Netherlands, they're often filled in sea or river beds. And that means that once the dikes are broken, the flood water would spread out and not reach great heights. Right. So a storm surge in the Netherlands is not a tsunami. It's not like a wall of water rolling into the countryside, it's more like this. There is one exception, and that's in the so called Kogemakaraya. The famous reclaimed lakes in the 17th century. We started to reclaim a lot of lakes in this area of the country. And they, they were deep because they were lakes, so they were four meters deep or even six. And here, if you had a break, breach of the dike, of course, there would, be, there would be more energy, so it would be more like a bath tube. And over time, because of the subsidence of the peaty soils, and the peaty soils occur in the coastal areas of this area. Over time, uh, the PT soil subsided, and then the whole of this part of the country became more and more like a bathtub. It's only after 1800 that purification of figures becomes feasible. A good example is uh, done by the historian Marie de Rupa, referring to the flood of 1825. She compared information from a descriptive contemporary disaster study with administrative records re relating date, place, and time of death. And although this, this region of Waterland was flooded entirely, and local people say it was a major flood, and contemporary historians have, say it's one of the biggest floods ever, there were only 17 people killed in that area. And that was only uh, about two or three per village. Now, one may wonder if, if that's really dramatic. And this kind of figures make me realize that actually, in these low parts, the culture was, or the people were quite adapted to big floods. And it made me think, uh, how did they do it? How did they survive those uh, 2,000 years of floods? And unfortunately, I came across a great banker who moved from uh, Australia to England recently, he's now at the University of Hull. He studied first buildings and developed the <coughs> concept of disaster culture, and then he moved to studying the North Sea Basin, and he uh, decided to use the concept of risk culture, because we don't have real disasters compared to the Philippines. 
and I borrow this um, definition of risk culture. A risk society is one whose people have had to adapt to one or more related hazards as a frequent life experience. One where risk has become deeply embedded in the culture, one where it is very much an integral part of the historical processes of that society, and one that profoundly influences the political structure, economic system, and social order of things. Um, again, we would have to realize that in this part we had floods at least once in 30 years, and in particular areas even once in 50 years. So on average, if every person would experience a major flood once in his lifetime. And if you were lucky, twice. And then, of course, you had the experience, the accumulated experience of the generations before you. So you had the stories of your parents, your grandparents. So in total, you had two or three or four floods that gave you information about what to do during a flood. And that sort of adds up to making a culture. I want to go into these uh, landscape features, the elevation of settlements, and the water based transport. And then I move to number one. The amphibious culture as expressed by compartmentalization. It's an awkward word, but I didn't find any other word in here that comes near to it. Do you see a map of um, a part of Holland called West Frisia in 1675? And the basic idea is that all these black lines are dikes, interior dikes, two to three meters high. And when, once flooding occurred, it would occur unit per unit, and so people had time to flee. So, um, living on elevations, now there are natural elevations and man-made elevations. And I put that in this model, it's a model of a, a standard folder. Natural elevations are the dunes, the coastal dunes along the sea. So here we have a settlement which is not flooded, it's entirely safe because it's on the dunes. There may be anything between 5 and 20 meters above sea level. Um, there is also other natural elevations like old um, part of, at the side of the river, what's that called in English? Um, geological rivers. Bank. Bank. Yeah. yeah. So natural river banks are sitting under the peak somewhere. They may uh, form a natural elevation. But there are many more human-made elevations. The, the main one is the dike. Mm -hmm. but something like this. And there are terpen. Now I wasn't sure if terp is an English word. Is the origin? No, probably not. So we call them mound. A relatively high mound, but not more than two meters. And farms built and mounds are safe during floods. That's the idea. Um, these houses are probably built in the at the bottom of the pole, which is a very bad idea in times of um, storms. And other uh, man-made elevations are dams. So a dam is typically between two pieces of the dike. If you have a river, a normal river, you have to close it with a dam, which loses, and you can also live on top of the dam. So in Holland, it was quite visual. And many cities you may know of were start like that, like Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Egan, Montingham, so many big cities were started at the mouth of a river on top of the dam. But the most interesting uh, one I found actually is this one, because this is a very small scale strategy. You just have to, to move in some sand before you start building your farm. It is low cost and it's very effective. Um, when uh, cities developed in the Middle Ages, the idea of living on an elevation continued, not only on dams, but many cities were actually uh, elevated in the early modern time. Uh, so the whole city centre of Amsterdam, for instance, is situated on four meters of sand that was brought in from the dunes. So people were so clever not to start building before they had made some type of elevation. And as a result, the, the cities would stand out like dry islands during a flood, and they would serve as refuge places for the victims of the submerged countryside. Now you may 
uh, imagine this as a, as a city now, now changing from a village in the city and standing on its own same. So this is the, what it would look like, a city with water all around. Um, here the victims of the countryside that, that were that were flooded could, could uh, take shelter in the city. Just one example, in 1825 the city of Amsterdam accommodated 19 refugees from the uh, submerged territories to the north. But once they were preserved, so to say, cities could also become a center of help. Um, you could start uh, repair actions, repairing the dikes again, starting from the cities, uh, especially if in the cities you would keep the dike materials. You could uh, get your ships from, from the harbor of the city to get the material transported towards the dike to repair the hole. Um, you could get the, the military uh, the military forces stationed in cities to secure public um, order at, at the countryside where the villages are deserted, so immediately plundering starts, and that you could help or try to um, prevent. And then later cities might also become um, centers where you would start reorganizing the whole countryside and, and draining off. The, the land again. So the, the city sort of becomes the uh, focal point after a flood to a large extent because it would not flood it. Before 1800, all people had a boat. Every farmer had a boat. And this is a nice illustration. This is the farm. The farm is sitting here. And in front of the farm, there is a footpath directly going to the boathouse. Here's a small rowing boat underneath, probably. And here is a larger sailing ship that you can use to go down to the cities. This is the river line in this case. Not only farmers, but also people in the town would have a boat. Most cities in the, in the Netherlands had more canals than streets in the early modern period. And many people were uh, affiliated with trade in one way or another, so they needed their boats to, to bring the goods to the, the ocean ferrying ships. So there were a lot of small boats around. And I'd like to say that these small boats symbolize the easiness of transport over water in the amphibious culture. It's the basic condition for amphibious behavior, swiftly and safely moving in and between the wet and dry parts of the landscape. Um, here you see the cover of a uh, book that commemorates a flood, the one of 1825, and this is the icon, an individual person who, who rescues a family with a small boat. So you, you take the boat into the polder and then you can do your beneficial activities. And this also made it to um, fiction, literature. Here you see another small boat coming up. This is the local policeman in this story of um, the beginning of the 19th century. He found a safe refuge in a big farm standing on a own mound with his family. He was a clever person, but his neighbors had a, an old a bad house, which is not standing on the mound, so it's submerged, and they were trying to rescue themselves at the attic, where the whole house is falling apart because of the movement of the water, and that was a common thing. So he would come out with a little boat and say, please be on bringing also to the farm. The same type of rescue strategy would apply to cattle, and the one place to bring your cattle to is the church. Churches were typically situated at the most elevated places of a village. And they were the only public buildings, and they were often the only big public buildings. And from the 1600 onwards, there were even churches being built explicitly as refuge for church. This is the Church of Edom, 1622, which was built as a refuge church. I mean, this is a small, very small town, like thousand inhabitants, but this church is as big as a cathedral. So both the inhabitants and their cattle fit it into the church. And that's what you see on this one, it's from another village, but it's the same idea. And look here, this part of the church is good for <laughs> storing the hay, <coughs> storing the hay for the cattle. This is long tradition of cultural adaptations I've um, sketched. That is what I call this amphibious culture. And the, the, the landscape feature includes a relatively slight difference between sea level and average field level. 
and the land structures in compartments made possible by interior dikes. Many settlements were sufficiently high above the field level, both on natural and man-made elevations, in order not to be flooded when dikes broke. The cities stood out like islands. They provided the reserves for a restart of the more terrestrial life, including refuge from victims, labor materials, and securing the public order. And transport by dikes and waterways to these higher places guaranteed possibilities for rescuing humans and animals. I think the idea of the amphibious culture contributes to understanding how the vulnerability of people differ per group, for instance, cattle races against other occupations. Per region, I talked about deeper and less deep holders, and also over time. And that refers to changes in transport systems. And from that, I want to make a step into the world of today. And that's my last paragraph. In the Netherlands, um, this amphibious culture got lost for a large part, and that started already in the 19th century. The use of new technology and materials led to the construction of very strong dikes. Imagine we now have dams and dikes made with concrete, reinforced concrete. That's typical, a typical product of the industrial age. It's a chemical product. And so we have enormous storm surge barriers now. You may know, you may know the Delta Works in the province of Zealand. Closure Dam of 1932. Um, and as a result, the reception of risk changed a lot. Uh, also, the introduction of the fossil fuel uh, driven engine changed transport. Instead of boats, you got cars, all sorts of auto motorization. And that leads, leads to a strong reduction of, of practical boats. We still have recreation boats, but uh, most of them are motor boats. So in order Imagine to carry over a, a, one, a small boat with a very heavy machine over the pole and like that is not feasible anymore, as far as I can think. Now, the other thing is we started to build at the bottom of the polders. For instance, uh, Schiphol Airport, Amsterdam International Airport is situated at one of the lowest points of the country, four meters below sea level. So as a result for flooding, we do not need a storm surge anymore. A long period of rain is sufficient. Um, at the same time, the costs of potential floods from sea have risen enormously, so we keep building dikes. Um, so we lost the capability to adapt to flooding. At the same time, the, the risk of flooding increases, the cost has increased a lot, and we um, we are very helpless if there are floods because people cannot flee anymore to a house which is situated slightly above the field level. We have seen that in the 90s when the rivers flooded, uh, many towns built uh, quarters into the riverbeds and they are completely unprotected because people rely so much on water control and, and dike control that the idea that things will go wrong is not got lost. 